Um, welcome to the first um, edition of Ask the Historians. Uh, Rachel and I, good morning, good morning. And uh, if you have any questions along the way, um, don't hesitate to put, um, put it into the chat boxes. I think Rachel's already mentioned. We're gonna try to answer some questions at the end if we have time. Um, the idea today is not to ask us a bunch of questions right at the moment, but we're gonna each, each month try to share a couple stories of past questions. And in fact, maybe some questions that people have specifically asked for this, um, for this program to try to give you a sense of some of, the, some of the history questions we get and how we help people and try to answer some of these questions. So um, the idea is just kind of give you a little bit behind the scenes in the research center. And uh, um, we think it's a perfect uh, sort of virtual program. And maybe when we're able to be more face-to-face, -face, it'd be a good chance to sit around the table and chat about some of these things. So without further ado, uh, on to Rachel Berlinski, our incredible operations manager, and really the person who runs the research center day to day. So on to Rachel to start us off. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to start off today's program with one of the most fun questions that I've gotten, certainly recently, but maybe in a long time. Um, very strange and you will see why. So our first question uh, came to us actually from a caller who did not want to share her name with me, um, but she just had a seemingly simple question. She called earlier this summer while the museum was closed and was hoping that this was something that everybody knew. It seems like it might be something that everybody knows, but certainly I did not have the answer right away. Um, and some of you here might already know what the answer to this question is. What Oak Park department store had a cage of monkeys? So um, I had to sort of ask her questions to piece together the memories that she had. Um, Cause again, I had no idea. So this caller remembered a store on Lake Street east of Lake Theater, but still in downtown Oak Park. Uh, in the early 60s, she would stop by the boys department to look at a cage of live monkeys. So at first, I tried looking at business listings from the late 50s and early 60s, because um, we have phone books for that time period, but the business listings weren't much help with the little information that I had, and with so many department stores in Oak Park at the time. So I recruited the help of volunteer Debbie Mercer to use some online sources. And she found the answer that put all of these pieces together. She found an article from 1957 showing that these monkeys came to Lytton's department store. And according to the article, the boys department housed a cage of five capuchin monkeys for the entertainment of its customers. So Lytton's was located at the northwest corner of Lake and Forest in Oak Park. And the store opened at this location in 1957 and was there until 1986 when the chain went bankrupt. And a little more about the company. Um, Henry C. Lytton started his business with small shops in Michigan and Indiana. By 1887, his success had grown and he opened a store at the corner of State and Jackson in downtown Chicago. So other branches opened up in surrounding suburbs like Evanston, Evergreen Park, Skokie, and even Gary, Indiana. Their sales focused on men's and boys clothing. And I would guess that was probably to compete with Marshall Fields and some of the other stores at the time that were really focused on selling to women. And you can definitely see that in this advertising from the 20s. Um, this brochure is one that we have in our collection and it's showing some really great pictures of the inside of the boys and men's departments of the Oak Park store. So wait a minute. Earlier I said Litton's opened in 1957 there were actually two Lytton stores in Oak Park. And the first was opened in 1927 on the south side of Lake Street uh, near where today's sort of the book table would be. Uh, and you can see this building in the photo on the left. 
that store was also called The Hub and proved successful so that in 1957, they built a new building sort of across the street. And you can see that in the photo on the right. The old store closed simultaneously as the new one opened. And I have a quote from that week in the Oak Leaves saying, it was a case of the old making room for the new. Not a small amount of nostalgia was present when the lights were turned out. So kind of a, a sense of how Oak Park was updating and changing at the time. Now back to these monkeys. Uh, the other Lytton's locations were using this promotion in the early 50s. And as far as I had, as far as I can tell, Evanston was the first to have these monkeys around 1950. When the store opened in Evergreen Plaza in 1952, the Evanston monkeys were transferred to the new store. And oddly enough, there's a story that goes, one of the monkeys escaped into the air ducts on arrival and was never heard from again. So this might not be true for the Oak Park store, but the Evanston store also had a collection of parakeets in the girls department. And I'm not sure how long the Oak Park store had monkeys in the store. However, I have a, a sort of strange clue um, I saw an article from the following year, 1958, after it was the first anniversary of the new Littons being opened in Oak Park. And earlier I said that they started out with five, and this article from 58 says that there were only four. So I don't know what happened to that one, and I'm not sure what ended up being with the other four, but uh, some of you perhaps might know this or remember or um, certainly have some memories of the store itself. And I will take this opportunity to say that if you have any um, thoughts to share or memories or questions about my segment today, feel free to put those in the chat box. I wanna finish with just a little more information about that corner, the Northwest corner of Lake and Forest because it's really, I think, a case study of sort of the character of Oak Park um, and like the changing legacy that we have. Um, in the early days of Oak Park, uh, the building that was at that corner was called Temperance Hall. And this was used as the first schoolhouse and the meeting place for a lot of church groups and organizations as Oak Park was becoming a bigger village and organizing. And before a lot of these churches especially had their own buildings. So it was really a testament to the early community of Oak Park. And today it's the site of Oak Park's newest skyscraper, Albion Tower. Um, and I will say no more about Albion Tower because a lot of you have opinions, but I think, again, it's a real case study of how Oak Park has changed over time. So with all that, I think I will pass this on to Frank. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I was um, uh, starting this off saying, here's kind of how we hope ask, ask the historians go. And one of the things we're talking about is not an opportunity to just research like your own individual families or buildings or something like that, but it's kind of broader questions. And yet we're always open to people who are researching their families, the building they live in, an old family home. And sometimes general questions come to us that actually touch on people and places that we want to share this, this next uh, example of a question that's come to us recently. So on to the next slide, Rachel. Here's the question. I received an email in January, um, early January from Lacey Sakura. Some of you might know the name. She's an excellent writer at the Wednesday Journal and writes a lot of real estate and about real estate in the community. And the question came up because this building uh, near the corner of Chicago and Marion um, was back in the news because uh, the owner had wanted uh, had approached the village to get a zoning variance to add an addition behind it to add more uh, rental units, I guess maybe two rental units if I remember correctly. So essentially this building 
is a multifamily building. And the question is, it looks more like an old single family home. And so the question was, what do we know about the history of this building? So there was sort of this broad question for a, uh, an article in the local newspaper about real estate. And just to give you some orientation, those of you who are familiar or maybe less familiar with this corner, um, this is, the actual address is 420, um, 420 North Marion. And it's just um, south of the corner of Marion, Chicago. Um, really at that corner, when you're looking south, is if you're on, across the intersection, on the, uh, to the uh, right next to this building is O'Connor's Cleaners. And then next to that, to the east is Pilgrim, uh, real, actually is a single family character home and then Pilgrim Real, uh, real Estate. And then you get into the Frank Lloyd Wright so-called bootleg homes right in a row. So it's on that sort of south side of Chicago at Marion. But um, immediately when she, this question was asked, this is one of those cases where we had some background knowledge and then we had a lot of wonderful things in, in the files about this. So um, basically this house, um, and maybe go to the next slide. Well, actually, I was just hold on for a second before I turn it. You notice the turret you see in the front there. It's a beautiful, it's a, I think it's a building that more people would know. It's a little bit an odd location because you have the Chicago Avenue commercial and then you kind of go south and there's some single family, but a lot of multifamily. So um, the, the short answer is that this house was built as a single family house in 1894. And on to the next slide. And here's some of the evidence in this sort of paper trail is um, on the left, you see here um, an 1895 Sanborn uh, insurance map. And those of you who are unfamiliar, it's a wonderful tool that was done for fire insurance purposes, but it gives you a sense of the original configuration of buildings, et cetera. And on the left, you see this building at the corner of Chicago and Marion. And you can see there's the turret I pointed out in the last photograph, but there's also a second turret that's still on the building but you can see how it was much more dramatic right at the corner, the turret at the corner and then a second turret. Um, really a gorgeous building. And um, you'll see how it had this big lot with a kind of two story um, barn behind it. That's sort of a, a coach house or a barn is the, is the pink building with an X. That means it's a brick building. And um, next to it, you see what's been moved already in the 1947 Sanborn map. So going to our files, again, we have files kind of street by street files. I was reminded of this article from 1913 in the Oakleys that George Norton Holt, um, N-O-R-D-E-N-H-O-L-T, um, was, um, uh, this article says in 1913 in April in Oakleys, um, 25 years ago, George Norton Holt bought the lots at the southeast corner of Chicago Avenue in Marion. And he said, quoted as saying, at the time, I expected to build stores on the corner at the end of 20 years but I am five years late. So in 1913, he basically had built his own home in 1894. And he, he always had the idea because he was also a kind of a, a real estate guy. He did a lot of investment in real estate that he was going to pick up and move the house to the back of the lot and sell it for commercial when the time came. So he just kind of buying this lot. It looks like from a descendant of the Kettle Strings, one of the sons of the Kettle Strings. And also the Gale family was involved in selling him this lot because the Gale family, you know, again, was involved in real estate and had those homes to the, uh, to the east on Chicago Avenue um, that Frank Wright designed as a side project. So essentially, um, there's a great description of how, what a beautiful uh, three-story residence and how he's going to pick it up and move it so it's turned to face Marion. And that's what was done. And in fact, he and his wife were getting older at that point and their kids had left the home. And he wanted also kind of a rental property, like you could rent out some of this, you know, turn this into a multifamily. So um, the excellent story about moving buildings can, can, comes up here then. So like, wait a second, why would you bother picking up that, move, that, that building instead of wrecking it? Well, um, also the second story is just the Norton Holtz, pretty elaborate, cool house. And again, in our files, we have photographs um, of the family's bakery. Um, George Norton Holtz and his wife came from Germany and he had been an apprentice baker in uh, Germany and had actually worked a lot in some of the, steam, um, the ocean going vessels where he was like a baker on those ships. And he finally came to Chicago and there's an article in the 1890s and again in his obituary in the 1930s about how he saw this great opportunity to open a bakery in Oak Park. So he came out here and uh, had a bakery on Lake Street just, um, just east of, uh, of Harlem, kind of on the, uh, on the south side of the street there. Um, so building this home was uh, sort of his sort of, you know, sort of uh, 
doing well and building a kind of grand home in the mid 1890s after being here for about 10 years or so. And um, the, uh, the thing about the Norton Holtz too, our biographical start, files start coming in because you look at these old photographs of the bakery and there's a lot of wonderful stories about um, all the, the, the things that this family did in the community, um, which was also kind of a cool part of this particular research project. So yes, it was built as a single family to answer her question. It was built in 1894. We also, in our, one of our databases, had the information that Frank Thompson designed this building. He was a carpenter contractor who served in the Civil War and eventually became an architect. Back then, it was almost like self-training and you know, sort of apprenticing. So he, um, among the things he designed, he lived in River Forest, and he designed um, the River Forest Village Hall, which was torn down about 20 years ago, but the original sort of village hall from circa 1910. And also, he designed the building that we know as 10,000 Villages today at the corner of, of Marion and, um, and Westgate, or um, yeah, Marion and uh, Westgate there, the 10,000 Villages building. He built the first section of that or designed the first section of that um, um, for George Hemingway, the real estate company. And also um, the, the locally famous and uh, Mount Carmel Baptist Church, the African-American church that we have photographs of in such an important community institution for the early African-American community around here. So, so we, we were able to help her find the fact that it was built in 1894, that uh, Frank Thompson designed it. And uh, a lot about the George Norton Holt family, uh, he and his wife, Mary lived in that house essentially until they both died in the 1930s, a year apart. So it was in the house for 40 some, the, the house was in the family for 40 some years. Um, just, but moving on, this question of picking up this house and moving it to the back of the lot was something that was really fascinating to this writer and also to me. Years ago when I was studying for my master's in public history at Loyola, I did a master's sort of essay, kind of similar to a dissertation on a smaller scale, about the moving of buildings and focusing on Oak Park as a case study. Because it turns out it happened a lot. And I'm just going to um, share a couple other stories, just the, kind of the tip of the iceberg. This one question about this one house and this one family is a broader question too. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little context reading from uh, October 18, 1919 in the Oak Leaves. Um, and uh, uh, Philander Barclay, our bicycling uh, photographer and historian um, is quoted in this article. Um, the headline, it says, moving houses to save materials. A sign of the scarcity of houses and high cost of building is seen in the moving of houses, which a few years ago would have been summar summarily wrecked. Uh, many have remarked about the large number of houses being moved in Oak Park. This is in 1919. But within the month, on, only three have been moved. So you can say that's a lot of only three. But they blocked the, thor, the, the thoroughfares and appeared to be more numerous than they were. However, three house movings in a month is the record for recent times in Oak Park. And they go and they talk about this one particular house being moved from North Boulevard and Scoville to Augusta and Marion. And there's also talk about moving a house from Pleasant Street to Forest Park. And here's Flander Barclay chiming in. The village historian, they call him who collects pic pictures of early days in Oak Park, says that scores of Oak Park mansions of the olden times now are doing good service in Forest Park. Quote, 10 years ago, before the Northwestern was elevated, it was a common thing to see trains held up while a house crawled slowly on its road to Forest Park. Um, in recent years, many a good house, better in fact than those built now, have been torn down when it could have been more economical to move them. The high prices are making us more careful of materials, and that is a good thing. He's referring after World War I, there's a lot of shortage of materials, and so that's why, um, why houses are being moved. Um, so th it was a very common thing, actually. I mean, not that every house, so obviously a very small number compared to the total were moved, but it, um, I started tracing that, and just a couple more examples before I finish up. Next slide, please, Rachel. Um, at the corner of Lake and Marion, on the upper left photograph, there was an original bank building um, where the today's um, uh, Chase Bank is that was built as Oak Park Trust in 1924. This earlier bank building, State Bank of Oak Park, designed by the architect Fidelke, um, H.G. Fidelke, very important local architect, was picked up when they built the current building, picked up and moved to the back of the lot, kind of where the drive through is, just north of the main built, uh, bank, where we go to pick up pizzas at Melnati's if you go and uh, pick up pizzas back there. Um, and this building was picked up and moved when they built that building and it was only about 10 years old. So they thought it was worth saving and it had a beautiful interior and apparently became sort of the bank annex building. So some of you might remember in the fifties or sixties or something, the bank annex building, that was this building. And then in the lower right is the one that a lot of us have, have clear memories of because it was only some 20 years ago was when they picked up and moved the so-called Hemingway interim house 
next to the then main Oak Park Public Library at Lake and Grove before they built the current building. And it was picked up and moved to um, Chicago and Elmwood where it still is. And it was quite a community festival to see this house being moved down the street. And then on to the next slide, please. Um, it wasn't just shorter distances. Here's a house that was moved in Maywood to Thatcher, 600 Thatcher in 1949. There are a lot of houses moving, um, being moved when they put in the Eisenhower Expressway, moved out of the way of the right of way, et cetera. I'm not sure if this is one of them, but I know that happened in this time frame. Um, and that's, um, you know, there it is moving down the street. Um, of course, a lot of this stopped being as common when there's got to be paved streets and a lot more wires and viaducts and things that would block that and make it more expensive. Next slide, please. And I'm going to um, show you this house. The next slide is a, um, a wonderful house to end, end with. Um, upper left, there's that house built in 1909 by the Pratt family, P-R-A-T-T. -T, and they built it um, what's now, where, where today is located the Right Inn or the Hemingway's Bistro. Some of you might enjoy going there. Um, it was built in 1909. The architect was E.E. E. Roberts, beautiful prairie style house, tons of art glass. And this photo in the upper left is from Glimpses of Oak Park, 1912, where they focused on the beautiful houses of, of Oak Park in that, in that time frame. And in 1922, and again, reading from Oak Leaves, um, they decided that, um, that, that it should be moved because it was sandwiched between the new First Baptist Church and the big apartment building to the north in such a situation that it never received a ray of sunshine. And they decided to move it to the northeast corner of Iowa and Oak Park Avenue. And that building was picked up and moved at, um, and is now um, the 700 block of Iowa. Um, beautiful building, has all the original art glass and, um, and it's just, you know, looks very similar to as it was in 1912 in the other photograph. And I'm just gonna sh uh, stop with this, this, uh, this example from the Oakleys. Um, it is a large brick house. They consulted experts who said that, noth that, that that was nothing. They could take the house all the way to San Francisco if the lady wished. Three weeks ago, the voyage began and they talked about how they, how they um, kind of uh, jacked it up and took out the foundation. And they, they finished with saying that they're going to have a party as they're moving and people will come into the house and they'll be um, traveling along like a ship in the ocean. So, um, so even sometimes uh, moving a house, which we think is so odd, was, was, was the cause for a party in 1922 and was considered pretty common at the time. So that's, um, that's all I have about moving houses and how one research question leads to another, um, another uh, topic entirely. So um, I don't know, we have a few minutes left perhaps. And if there's any questions in the chat box that Rachel will handle, if we can answer anything about what we've talked about today, or if you wanna put a question in for next time, we'll try to answer future questions at future, um, Ask the historians. Yeah, thank you all for coming today. So, um, so far I have one comment in the comment box and I want to read this to everybody because I think um, some of the people who are on this call today have done research, um, house research, um, if you've looked at your own or if you look at other houses, um, you're, some of you are familiar with Sanborn maps. And um, really, I can stress the importance of how often I use them for pretty much any sort of research. Um, it just gives a really good snapshot of where, sometimes where a building is or what it looks like, at least on the outside at the time. So um, the comment in our box is from Joan Bledig. And she says, my mother worked for Sanborn maps in the 30s and 40s. And um, I would like, if jo um, we have a few minutes, Joan, if you want to take a moment to unmute yourself and talk about any of that, um, feel free. But otherwise, I will definitely be following up with you to ask more. Well, I don't think I can really say much about it. Mm -hmm. um, I was very young. Uh, my older brother knew more than I did. However, somewhere in my curio cabinets, I have uh, a Sanborn map ruler, which we had tons of them floating around the house as kids. It's about six inches long, mm -hmm. and it's a, a ruler that they use to measure off things to put the little um, icons for the houses. And I think my aunt 
My mother's older sister also worked there. And they, they called her back in the early 1950s to come in and, and work part-time because when she had my brother in 1943, she quit working full-time and was a full-time mother. And they called her back in the early 50s. And, and all I remember about that is riding into the city somewhere in the car with my brother and my father to pick her up from work. My brother said that she had a book. Um, I guess it would be like a guideline book of how to do whatever. And he remembered seeing it, but I don't recall it at all. I have no clue. Mm -hmm. It's very possible that some of the map plats that you have in the books there in your, your um, resources were actually worked on by my mother and my aunt. Oh my goodness, that is so cool. Um, and very fascinating because there's so many aspects of these books that are like hand done, it seems, or oh, yeah. done by real people, which is kind of a-, a well, My mother was one of those people that was pasting those buildings. If I can, I, I might have more than one of those Sanborn map um, rulers. And if I can find a second one, I'll bring it in. We would love it. Put it Absolutely. In stuff. Well, thank you, Joan. This is wonderful. Um, thanks for sharing. And I'm glad that our questions today sort of brought up this memory and added to our knowledge. Um, so with that being said, um, I think that is all that we have for today. So um, feel free to, again, um, ask more questions, send them in by email on the email on your screen. Um, or um, if you have questions about today's program, or if you have future um, questions that we might be able to research and share for future programs. So um, with that being said, I will sign off and thank everybody for coming today. Um, also check out our website to sign up for the next programs, Ask the Historian, which will be in a month, and um, Inside OPRF Museum, which we also do monthly, and the next one will be February 17th or something, something like that. So check that out on our website as well.